This is Limited Supply, the place for refreshingly real takes on what D2C is really like. We're your hosts, Nick and Moyes. Let's start talking about money. Hundreds of direct-to-consumer brands use Tatari's platform to buy and measure TV ads just like digital. They have deep publisher relationships that give you the best CPMs on linear and streaming TV. Check out their three-minute demo video at tatari.tv slash limited supply. Okay, Nick, special episode, uh, episode four, season five. This is a Q&A from the Slack community that we got. Yep. Um, it was it was fantastic. Uh, a bunch of people asked. I love uh, the Slack group. Yeah, it's so good. It's so uh, clean now. Yeah, it is organized. really. Yeah, yeah. Okay, first, how do people join the Slack group if they want to? You go to limited supply pod. Dot com. Okay, fantastic. There's about three thousand people in the uh, in the Slack group. It's free. Uh, there's no advertising. There's no shilling. Yeah, we kick out those people. I think we, last week we banned three. Yeah, yeah. We're kicking out people. We get a weekly report yeah. of people getting banned. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And like you know, if you if if you uh, try and shill to somebody, that person DMs us and they're like, "Look at this uh, screenshot of this person trying to You're sell out. a product." Yeah, you will get kicked out of that yeah. group. I really like that about our group. But it's also really helpful. Like I, I yeah. in fact, my favorite communities there are one Amazon, which. I didn't even realize it was going to be super helpful, but yeah. it's fantastic. Uh, the help wanted. And then we're starting to create like uh, channels specifically for different sizes. So if you're sub one, sub 10, sub 50, sub 100, or sort of in that range yep. so that you can communicate with peers, because obviously the guy who has a sub $1 million business may have different answers to the question of like, what should your tech stack look like than if you've got a $100 million business? You totally. should have different answers. Yep. Um, okay, so we talked about the the uh, the uh, I'm sorry the limited supply Slack channel. Uh, you can join. The link is going to be in this pod. If you're watching on YouTube, it's going to be below the video. Um, but let's start asking. Let's start responding to these questions. Let's do it. Which one do you want to go through first? Um, all right. So Moise, what do you see drastically shifting in 2023 and beyond in the world of D2C, specifically as it relates to apps, platforms, and software vendors? This is from James Dome. Okay. Um, Two things. One is I see uh, prices for certain things getting cheaper, uh, which is finally the case. Yeah. Uh, which is crazy, but um, there's just more competition. The industry yeah. is more experienced. Before, when you wanted to do reviews, there were only a couple guys offering reviews. Today, Clavio is offering reviews. There was only a couple guys doing. There was no competitor to Clavio. Now there's a competitor to Clavio, and that's going to impact new business at Clavio and maybe make them rethink think about pricing. Um, same thing with text messages and PostScript, right? Like people are getting wiser, and there's more competition when it comes to some SaaS platforms. And I think that's going to make the business a little bit easier in terms of uh, the co the cost that we have when it comes to that kind of stuff. Yeah, fully agreed. I agree with everything you said there. Uh, the only other thought I had was a lot of these companies that raised a bunch of money are not hitting their valuation targets for their next raise. And so uh, naturally their prices are getting cheaper or they're opening up lower tiers that have more features just to get high volume right. of users in. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I think Triple Whale redid their pricing and they said for 75% of people, this means your price will be cheaper. Yeah. Which I think they said. And they that. just launched uh, Founders Dash, which is like yeah, the free. OG Triple Whale, yeah, completely free. free. Yeah, which is pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, I think a couple other things are going to happen. One is uh, uh, from a VC world, the dollars will be ha very hard to come at if you're a young business. Good. So like um, pre-2013, pre-Dollar Shave Club and Harry's and all those guys, the real investors and in consumer brands were consumer investors like the VMGs of the world, the KKR. TSGs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They were like, basically like, we understand consumer. You built a brand and you brought it to 30, 40, $20 million in revenue, but you don't know how to make this into $200 million in revenue. And so we're going to step in and do this. And VMG, uh, and I know those guys because I uh, tried to, I, at one point I thought about raising money from them. You know, they invested in Justin's peanut butter, in, um, you know, Baby Gannix diapers, in like all of these brands a long time ago, really helped them grow and then sold the, like exited those businesses. Then they had to start competing with VCs. Yeah. And they were like, look, we've been used, to, we used to pay like, you know, 2X revenue for a brand. 
These guys are now wanting 10x. We can't compete at 10x revenue. This is yeah. crazy. And so 10x projected revenue pre-launch. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three years later. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so they were like, okay, we are going to, they're like, we don't know what to do here. And now VCs are like, well, you know what? Our investments, some of them panned out, but a lot of them didn't. And a lot of them are taking a really long time. And maybe the 10x valuation that we're, we were giving these businesses isn't accurate. Mm -hmm. And so now I feel like those old business, the old investors, the VMGs of the world, the uh, San Francisco equity partners, the Encore Capitals are back being like, hey, look, remember us? We're now the game in town again. We know yeah. we, are, we were disciplined. Maybe we lost a little bit of that discipline depending on who we were. But we we still understand these, this game. And we're really good at this game. And um uh, you know, we're going to be the investors in town. And that means that valuations are going to come down as well and be a little bit more reasonable. Yeah, totally agreed. What are the changes that you think are going to happen? Uh, no, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, I think pricing is going to get um, a lot more competitive. Um, you know, many of the apps that raised, like they, they just need users. I think um, to some extent, making software on your own or stitching together some no-code tools is also more accessible. And so I don't know that you can... Um, you know, like, I don't know that uh, every subscription platform has the ability, like, like what does Recharge do or, you know, some of these subscription apps do to justify a multi-hundred dollar a month thing when it's really just Stripe tokens that Stripe holds and charges? Sure. Um, and so I think, one, it'll it'll get cheaper on one side. On the other side, the, the companies that do charge, they're going to have to innovate a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, I have two other comments. One is um, I think people are going to be more omni-channel much faster. And I think yeah. that's already happened. Like, I don't think this is specific. This probably happened two years ago. Amazon and brick and mortar much earlier than you, we used to think. Um, like, you know, Dollar Shave Club didn't get into brick and mortar stores until like two or three years ago. It took them, a, you know, almost seven years. Native took five, six years. I think now it's going to happen much sooner. Yeah. Uh, okay, my other question is, what do you think will happen? It, will AI have any impact on e-commerce? Dude, I was going to ask you what your <laughs> thoughts were. I feel like uh, like two months ago, there was not a single conversation that didn't involve AI yeah, yeah. in terms of AI assistant, generative AI, uh, AI copy assistant, whatever, yeah. or even like AI for ad creative. But um, I don't know. I don't feel many people are talking about it anymore. Uh, or maybe they are, and I'm just not in those conversations, or they're different levels of conversations. I'm not at that level yet. I think you're right. I think there's going to be, I think it'll be marginally impactful, but not yeah. revolutionary. Agreed. So I think that, yes, it might make it so that you can get, um, you can create your own ad images. You don't, yeah. need, you don't need to go out and get an uh, UGC. You or can get studio. UGC made. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Just by typing in exactly what you want. Yeah, and that would be that would be a big deal. But I think that's still far away. You might be able to get some more images right now, being like, "Here's my stick. Here's my hint bottle. Show me it in a tropical environment or right. something like that." I'll I think it'll also be helpful with subject lines and emails. I think actually, I think Clavio already does a pretty good job of this, uh, helping make that subject line really like they have suggestions now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked at the suggestions a couple of times, and I was like. These are actually pretty good and not awful. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I was almost like I would never look like, when I saw this, I was like, I'm never going to look at those because yeah. this is some machines not going to be able to do as good of a job as me. And then I looked at them and I'm like, OK, never mind. These are pretty good. Yeah. And I think AI will have impacts that we never see like through Facebook ads. For sure. Um, yeah. But I think the the day to day usage will be more minimal than people were probably talking about two months. Ago. I find it really useful for research, like being able to say, find me research that claims this with supporting uh, evidence or or research or cite the research papers that's been probably the most helpful thing yeah that's right yeah okay let's talk about uh, let's move on to the next question this question was asked by frank um and this got a ton of reactions or a ton of upvotes which what he said um in episode four uh you mentioned you talk about the perfect daily report what metrics do you look at on a daily basis but uh didn't have time to cover and don't think you've ever touched on the topic again so basically, he's asking, what metrics do you look at on a daily basis? You're looking at a ton of brands. Are you mm -hmm. looking at any of those metrics? On, like, what brands are you looking at on a daily? I'd love to understand this from two parts from your end. What metrics do you look at on a daily basis for Sharma brands? And then what about for brands that you work with? Um, I mean, Sharma brands is probably more like around revenue or or like ad spend for clients. 
but for the brands we work with- Wait, I'm sorry, revenue for Sharma Brands? Is yeah. that is that like changing on a daily basis? No, no, no not at all. And then are, is there there's ad spend to get new clients or there's no, ad spend, ad spend oh, for, for the clients? Uh, on behalf of our okay, clients. Gotcha. Like how much are we investing? Yeah. Um, but we do have one master report with all of our clients. Uh, and this basically houses revenue. Uh, this is like, you know, you set your time period. Revenue, orders, items sold, because that's different than orders. Average order value. Uh, conversion rate, funnel metrics, so sessions to add to cart to check out. Conversion rate by top pages, so like top five URLs that drove the highest conversion. Uh, revenue per session, page views. Uh, profitable ROAS, so like a dollar to how much profit. Percentage of new sessions. Channel in, uh, Individual oh channel ad spend versus individual channel revenue, which is always you know over over attributed. Uh, top SKUs sold, so basically top products sold, shipping costs, and then the top ads, like what were the top ad creatives? They're spend, CPA, and ROAS. Spend, CPA. I'm sorry, so you you have that master report that you craft for brands? Yeah, so we, we build a custom report when brands on board with us, and it's a live URL that they can pull up at any time. And then, uh, and then we also have one master with all of our clients. With all of that information on there? Yeah. So you can just scroll. Wow. You just scroll. It's like you scroll a mile. And, and is that automatically, is that like updated through APIs or are you actually? Yeah. Somewhere? So we we have a, a reporting platform we use. We authenticate everything when we onboard and then um, you create it's just live. Report. Yeah. We never have to touch it again. Wow. So you have your own triple whale basically that you offer to yeah. your own brands. Exactly. Uh, do you ever look at metric? Do you ever look at how many of your... Uh, how many CEOs or let's let's say you onboarded Hintwater? Mm -hmm. uh, how many times do they like open up this dashboard that you've created for them? I'm not sure actually. We okay. should check. Yeah, I know yeah. that uh, for for most of our clients, they look at it daily uh, and probably multiple times a day. It's like the yeah. one dashboard they use yeah. for the e-commerce business. Yeah. Um, and is it a Sharma Brands doc? Like it's a Sh it's a, your link, right? Yeah, yeah. It lives on sbrands.co. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That is a lot. Yeah. Uh, here is here are the metrics that I look at on a daily basis: uh, revenue, uh, revenue by new customers versus returning customers. Okay, so I'm like, uh, let's say we did fifty thousand dollars in revenue today. Thirty thousand is coming from new. Twenty thousand is coming from returning. Um, then I'll say um, uh, I'll look at a couple of things. If we sent out an email campaign, then I'll say what was the open rate and click through mm -hmm. rate from that email campaign yesterday. If we send out an SMS campaign, I'll say, what was the uh, click-through rate and revenue driven from that SMS campaign yesterday? Um, so for if, so I'll do that if we've just sent out an email uh, or an SMS. Um, the other thing I'll look at is Facebook ads, Pinterest ads, and Google ads. Okay. And I'll look at- Is every Pinterest something you look at? Very, like, do you run a lot of Pinterest? You've brought up Pinterest a couple times. Recently. I'm the only guy on Pinterest. <laughs> I, I'm the only believer in Pinterest ads. Yeah. Why? And, uh, they're phenomenal. <laughs> they're so good. I don't really? understand. Yeah, they're so good. I, it's the greatest thing in the whole world. You're not that- uh, Actually, I shouldn't say that. It's um, They're not the greatest thing in the whole world. They are- 10% reliably 10% of Facebook revenue or 5% okay. of Facebook revenue. Look, if you're doing less than if you're spending less than $10,000 a day on Facebook, it's probably not worth it. Yeah. If you're spending more than $20,000 a day on Facebook, you should probably have some Pinterest ads going depending on what your product is. If you're a if you're 10,000 or True Classic or if you're a men's brand, if you're Gillette, there's no reason to be oh, well, men Gillette's a bad example, but you you know, Pinterest is just women. Yeah, yeah. Uh or I think it's just women, uh but it, it is really good. I, I it's good. Uh, not really good. It's good, uh, but yeah. I will look at Pinterest ads on a daily basis. I guess I've, uh, I, I, I I agree that a lot of people don't use it. Yeah, and I'm always like, you probably shouldn't because either you're a men's brand or you're not spending enough. But yeah. like, at some point you should. So I'll look at every single ad um, in Facebook, Google, and Pinterest from a UTM perspective. The spend on that ad going down to we spent 15 cents on this ASC ad creative to we spent twelve thousand dollars on this ASC creative, uh, and the CAC from that ad. Uh, you know, on a daily basis. And um, for native, I probably did this for two and a half years every single day. Yeah. Uh, I didn't miss a single day. Like, well, if I took a day off, if I took like a Saturday off uh, or a Saturday and Sunday off, like I, I'd have bad Monday because I'm like, I got to do Friday, Saturday. And so Sunday wait, you today. would pull your own numbers in manually? Every single, I'd not only that, I'd create an Excel spreadsheet and I'd be like, this is the spend on this creative. 
This is the number of orders we've got. This is the CAC from this creative. This is the revenue from this creative. And um, then I'd look at it all and be like, what is uh, CAC from Facebook? What is CAC from Google? What is CAC from Pinterest? And then I'd say, what does, um, what is overall, like what is blended CAC? Cause like, you know, some of the times you're not gonna get that. Yeah. Um, you're, Cause you're, you know, some people are gonna like click a Facebook ad, go to Google, not click an ad and purchase. So, you know, you're not gonna get that new customer. You're not gonna recognize that customer inside Facebook, inside Google, inside Pinterest. Um, and so then I'll look at it from a blended basis of like all new customer revenue, all new customers, all spend. So I'll say, let's say we spent $20,000 today uh, and we got a, a hundred customers today. Okay, great. Our you know spend is it's two hundred dollars per customer today. Got it. On a daily basis, no matter how many ads I have, and this will take me an hour every single day. Yeah, I remember at Hint <clears throat> um, when I joined, I had one person on my team, and her entire job was pulling these reports together. There used to be no good like good reporting tools back then. Yeah, like there are today. You can just plug into Peel Insights or Triple Whale. Yeah, and you get a, an iPhone app. Yeah, back then it was so manual. Yes. Um, I, uh, yes. And, um, you know, when I, uh, am really hands-on in a brand that I'm trying to help out, I will do this for that brand and personally do it and do it manually. And I won't be able to help that brand for 30, 60 days until I've done this for 30, 60 days. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, now I understand your business because I understand what's working and what doesn't. Is it lookalike audiences? Is it business as usual? Is it ASCs? Is it retargeting? It's like, what's working here? What isn't working? What sucks? Right. And uh, where can I help? And I still do this manually for brands on a daily basis. Like wow. I did this, it's Saturday. I did this this morning. Yeah. Like I, you know, I did it this morning for a brand. Wow. And like I do it daily. Um, and this takes a bunch of my time on a daily basis doing yeah. this for multiple brands. Cause I'm like, and, and it's a real pain in the butt sometimes, but it's so powerful. I, yeah. And I understand that using the triple wheels of the world and all those guys, the reality is doing it manually is so you much just, better. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like handwriting something That's versus right. typing something. Yeah, you're going to remember you're, it. Yeah. You remember it way better. And like, you know, you look at it and I'm just like, oh my God, this is a lot of, I'll be like, this creative bombed yesterday. What yeah. happened? What's going on here? Are there bad comments on it? Then you go and you see a comment. Yeah. Are yeah. there bad comments on it? Was it just this one day? It's been multiple days. And then the way I'll start looking at it, and like I'll do this for 60 days for a uh, business. And then I'll start putting in yellow anything where I'm like, this is not performing for more than four days. You should probably shut it off. Yeah. Um, and so it's super powerful. And in the Slack channel after this, I will post um, and a, a blank spreadsheet of what the outline looks like. Oh, that'd be sick. Um, and it's very, it's very simple. Uh, I kid you not where I've done this every single day and every month I start a new spreadsheet for every brand that I do this for to look into it, to be like, what's working and what isn't. It is the number, when people ask me, what do I do? This is the number one thing I do in e-commerce. I spend all of my time doing this. Yeah. Because it helps me, it informs me on what's the working and what's not. Totally. Uh, for, on a monthly basis, I'll be like, what does it look like from a cohort perspective in terms of returning customer rate, uh, repeat purchase rate? Um, you know, what does our open rate look like? You know, what I love in Clavio is those like benchmarks. Right. I love those benchmarks to be like, how am I doing here? What's my open rate look like? Um, and so on a monthly basis, I'll look at a bunch of stuff and create a full P&L. Uh, if I were running a business, which I'm not, I just do the Facebook stuff. Uh, but on a daily basis, we'll look at those Facebook ads. And I don't understand why everyone doesn't do this, especially, you know, look at Native, even when I, even when Native was doing 75, $80 million a year, I was still doing this mm -hmm. personally. And I wouldn't let anybody else do this because I was like, you're not going to give a shit like I care. Right. Um, and I don't understand why businesses don't do this, why CEOs don't do this. They don't want to get their hands dirty. And this takes a lot of time and effort. Yeah, they're too good for it. Yeah, don't be too good for this. This yeah. is too this is too important to give up. Yeah. Agreed. And if your business is built on ads or marketing, which all of these e-commerce businesses are, don't give this up. All right. Next question from Janelle. Janelle says, if you're building mostly solo at the moment, who is the first hire and what is their role that will give you the most momentum? Okay. I have two options here. Yeah, I'm curious let's what, hear yours. Okay, so mine are, uh, from what I've seen, most, most of the time, if somebody's building solo and uh, they haven't failed, they're usually good at storytelling and sort of um, describing the brand and building the brand. Uh, what they're usually not good at is either product and ops or growth, like bringing customers in or making sure the product gets proportionally better over time. And so the two people I wrote are, you know, depending on which one you need more, one is a growth person, somebody who can help you from uh, e-commerce management, merchandising, you know, making sure the site's working, testing new layouts of landing pages, overseeing your ads, you know, getting better creative. 
And the other person is probably on the product side. Like, how do you make shipping more efficient? Or like we were talking about a couple episodes ago, knowing how big the box should be to hit the right mark in the shipping cost. Um, or, you know, using, looking at your 3PL bill and making sure that's good, or just making sure you're getting samples, uh, far out in advance so that, you know, you don't, uh, get stuck with Chinese new year when it's time to place your order. Yeah. I think that's the exact right answer. Um, I would add one caveat to that, which was at native, our first like four hires were customer service people. Yeah. And, um, but I think that you're right about a lot of that. Um, uh, hire customer service people, uh, but uh, like a lot of people would say maybe your first hire should be customer service so that you don't have to do it. I'd say, yeah, your first hire can be customer service, but don't ever stop doing that. Or like, don't stop doing it for the first couple of years, even have, if you have that person yeah. until you're at 20, $30 million and feel like you really have product market fit. Until then, you want to understand the problems of the business. You want to be like, you know what you're going to understand is what like what an unboxing experience is doing poorly. Uh, when somebody doesn't love a scent, uh, when um, products are leaking in transit, um, when shipping is taking a really long time, all of that stuff you're going to understand if you're doing customer service. Uh, and like a lot of times, if you out either you outsource that or make a hire a really junior hire for that, those people may not have the confidence or uh, you know courage to come to you and say, "Hey, look, I think there's a problem in the business." Mm -hmm. And I found that a lot. Like sometimes I'd be like, "I think we're out of stock on something," and we'd be like, "Yeah, we are out of stock." And I'm like, "How has nobody told me this? Yeah. Uh, what is going on here?" Yeah, and. Um, you know, I, I think it's really important to foster a culture of like, hey, you should be able to communicate even with problems, for sure. problems you've created, no problem. Uh, but I think doing that customer service is really important. Uh, you know, I think customer service can be your first hire, but I think that ultimately, yes, um, you're, uh, you know, you should still be doing it. I think you're right. That that person who helps you with marketing is your next hire. Yeah. Like, yes, you want to create emails. You can't create enough emails that you should be creating. Yes, you want to create creative for your Facebook ads. You probably can't do that all yourself or fast enough to do that yourself. Yeah. You want you want a second set of eyes on those emails. You want a second set of eyes on SMSs so you don't accidentally say, uh, where the fuck is this in that SMS, right? You didn't yep. accidentally type that instead of in the SMS instead of in Slack. Yeah. Like you want that second. So I think that is the next hire. I think the operations person, you're absolutely right. I think especially if you're north of $5 million in revenue, now there's meaningful cost savings to be had. If you optimize your shipping, if you optimize your box, so it mm -hmm. weighs a little bit less. If you optimize where your 3PL is and the method that you're shipping, should you be shipping USPS Ground Advantage or UPSMI or FedEx Smart Post? Like there, those are worthwhile conversations to have now because they will cost you ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars a month. Uh, if you're if you're doing five million dollars in revenue, you don't need an operations person when you're doing sub a million dollars in revenue. You should be able to do it yourself. If you have so many products that you can't do it yourself, and you're doing sub a million dollars, you can probably cut a few of those. Yeah, views. totally. Cut cut many of those. Yeah, but that is a really good question. Yeah. You can't just rely on paid social and PPC for growth. Hundreds of brands like True Classic, Daily Harvest, and Manscaped have turned to TV advertising using Tatari's platform, and they're absolutely crushing their acquisition goals. Many of my own clients at Hooks also use Tatari. We used them while I was at Native2, and I can tell you that their team is awesome and the measurement is just like digital, so you'll see site visits, purchases, or even installs from TV. Check out their three-minute video at tatari.tv slash limited supply. Um, okay, next, next question. Uh, from Sean Puri, uh, he says, he's the MFM guy, uh, my first million. Sean asks, what percentage of revenue do you target for headcount ads during a business scale up? Let's say you're in year two or year three. Yeah, I'm curious what your take is here. Um, good question. Uh, very, very low. And it, mine, I like, you know, I think a lot of people spend way too much on headcount. Yeah, and so, I, always and I come think back I spend way too little on headcount. Yeah, you, I feel like your rule of thumb is for every million dollars, you get one employee. Yeah, and um, I, th I think it's even less than that, actually. Like um, at Native, at our peak, we were doing uh, $750,000 per month per employee, which is insane. Wow. So we were doing, you know, $8 million, $9 million per year per employee. Wow. I think that's too low. Uh, yeah. I think that is a good <laughs> method of thinking about it. But I'd say probably a mi $2 million, like... Early on, maybe yes, a million dollars uh, per per employee per year. So if you're at ten million dollars, you can have ten employees. If you're at twenty, 
you can have 13, four, I think at some point it gets yeah, worse. It tapers you can't, off. Yeah, exactly. You can get, you have to do a million five, then $2 million. A year. Right. So I, it, it definitely depends. I would say I target under 10%. If I see businesses with 20%, you know, if it was Sharma Brands, I'd say this is different. You're not selling an e-commerce business. Sure. You need people to run your business. But if you're an e-commerce business and 20% of your revenue is spent on headcount, that is a lot of lost dollars. Uh, and I'd be very, very worried about that. I yeah. would say under 10%, I feel good. Uh, under 5%, I'm like, you're doing really well. Under 2.5%, which I've seen, you probably need to hire more but I, I like you. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the um, like uh, clients that we have at Sharma Brands, most of their uh, digital team is probably, you know, uh, like for, on a marketing side, it's no more than usually three people. And that could be a brand that's doing uh, 100 million in D2C or 25 million in D2C. Um, but they have uh, a lot more like agencies and contractors that they work with. And they might use and then turn off for a bit and go back to them as they need uh, versus having all these people internal. Yeah, I do think that like um, our business is unique and that like we have so many third parties that it can like skew this number of like, okay, well, you have an agency. Doesn't that count? And yeah, it does count. Um, you know, for us, uh, when we sold the business, we were eight employees. And I think by far the largest group was customer service. It was four or five employees in CS. Um, I think that like a, you can do a lot like you, we all underestimate what we can do. Agreed. We can probably do a lot. And if you're like, it, it also depends on the mode that you're in. If you're in growth mode, you probably need to focus more on products and strategy and branding. And if you're in like maintenance mode, which is two or three years, you might be in maintenance mode. You, pr you might be like, look, all I need is CS, some operations, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I think that kind of stuff does depend. And like, you know, when I was running it, I was like, look, I'm good at Facebook ads, but I'm not good at Google ads and I'm not good. At, and our Pinterest ad rep at the time, I'll tell you, was running our Pinterest ads. <laughs> That's how good he was. Yeah. And then we had some agency helping us with some emails, when we, probably like year three or year four as well. Yeah. I think the answer to Sean's question, which is a really good one, is less than 10 percent is right there are reasons that it could be more than, even with agencies, I think it's probably less than 10%. There are reasons it could be north of 10%, um, but like north of 20%, I'd really be like, you have to justify this because this seems like, if we were in a board meeting and someone said I'm 10%, I'd be like, we can move on. Someone said I'm 2%, I'd be like, why is it so low? And if someone said I'm 20%, I'd be like, we need to have a conversation. What's going on over here? Yeah. Why do you have some for people? For like some of the boards you sit on, do you know where that number is? Uh, yeah. Um, they're pretty good actually. Most yeah. are pretty good. There are, there are instances, uh, not on boards that I said on where I've seen where I'm like, why do you have so many people in this marketing department? Like, and the reality is you have to be really disciplined as a CEO. Cause the first thing anyone does, like when someone's hired after a couple of years, you know what they want to do? Manage somebody. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. They're like, yeah, I'm 24 now. I need to manage somebody. I need three <laughs> direct reports. Yeah. And like, uh, one, I hate direct. I want zero direct yeah. reports. The Nobody fewer, the talk better. to me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's the difference between like, you know, when you get to an executive level, like when you're, when you're growing, you're like, look at how many direct reports I have. Yeah. It's awesome. When you're an executive, you're like, please, nobody yeah, please talk to stop me. texting me. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> uh, I think that, but I think that's true. But I think that um, there will be as much work as you uh, give people, right? Yeah. If you're like, totally. so, so the more people you hire, they'll find a way to look busy or keep busy. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's really scary. Like, if you fired three people on your staff right now, uh, what would change in your revenue right. uh, in the next six months? And if the answer is nothing, then you might be, then you should stop hiring at least. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's a, that's a good way to look at it. Agreed. Um, okay. Let's go on to uh, no, the next question. All right. So Arban show asked, what percentage of revenue oh, God, do you target so from bad. upsells and cross sales? Do you use post-purchase upsells? And if so, what is your ghost go-to post-purchase upselling strategy? And I will also caveat by saying your case is probably going to be very different than the average because of your travel size deodorant that was sold, which awesome. I think made for like, what, 30% of revenue or something? That was the best, like, um, okay, so first, the guy who told me about this was Ezra Firestone. Um uh, every time I think about Ezra Firestone, I have such warm and fuzzy feelings. Yeah. I'm like, thank you so yeah. much. He'd be like, have you, has anyone does this post-purchase upsell? And I'm like, this is the greatest idea in the history of the world. 
And uh, at the time we launched it, we were on WooCommerce and we actually had it so that the post-purchase upsell was a separate Stripe charge, which was deadly because we had to pay an additional 30 cents on that charge. Yeah. And then 2.9, I mean, it wasn't 2.9%. I think we were like 2.1, but like, you know, we had to pay that separately. Um, and then we figured out a way to make it so it's on one Stripe token, not two Stripe tokens, two Stripe charges. Um, you know, I think uh, the way I, I don't think about it as what percentage of revenue do you target from upsells, cross sells? I, I think of it as particularly post purchase upsells. I think it, uh, I think of it as what percentage of people are opting in to that post purchase yeah. upsell. Like, um, and there are uh, the other thing I think about when I'm thinking about post purchase upsells is how can this be? Look, here are ways to make it uh, to make the opt-in rate really, really high. And I remember Ezra saying this, which is whatever you're selling, sell it again for cheaper. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you just bought eucalyptus and mint deodorant for $12. Would you like to add another stick for $10? Because now you look like you got ripped off, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> this is cheaper now, baby. Uh, and so that's going to be not, not just like, do you want to buy uh, deodorant? Do you want to buy the exact same thing you bought for a little bit cheaper? That probably has the highest opt-in rate. And it's probably the best one you can go to. For us, I wanted to sell something that I thought would be uh, would have a high opt in rate, but wouldn't cannibalize sales. So if yeah. you buy two coconut two coconut vanilla deodorants, now I'm not going to see you for a while. So we'd sell travel sizes to get people to buy, like you know, to be like, look, hopefully, I'm hoping you put this travel size in your purse, in your travel bag, uh, wherever it is, or in your gym bag, and you use it when you need those. That when you use it, but you don't like it doesn't cannibalize sales of a big one. Yeah, it's just when you're at the gym, you're not using the gym deodorant; you're using right. our deodorant. And so um, that uh, you know, my goal would be a twenty to twenty five percent opt in rate for the post purchase upsell. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most valuable, some of the most valuable real estate in the, in the entire ecosystem for that sure. you've got. You've already got the customer's payment information; they've already purchased. You've got their address. You've got their shipping information. You're going to ship them a box. So your pick and pack fee is pretty much that. Your postage is pretty much that. The question is just, do you pay an additional item fee to that to your 3PL or do you not? So the costs are very low here for you. Um, the question is just, can you get that? Uh, can you get them to make that purchase? Um, and so we got them, uh, I think it was like a 22% opt-in rate. Yeah. And I'll tell you one other thing that we did at Native, which I have not shared in the past. I should have done a Twitter thread about this, but fuck it. Um, we tested a $3, $4, and $5 price point on that travel size. There was no, the the, the opt-in rate did not dwindle at all. It did not go down even 0.1% at $5 and at $3. Wow. We made more money at $5, obviously, than at $3. The opt-in rate didn't change. Uh, we didn't go with five dollars. We charged three dollars. Why? Um, I I wanted people to love us. Yeah. And like I was like you know people were like why don't we charging as much as today? We can? What would you do? Would you still be at three? Uh, today I would, yeah today I would definitely be at three. Yeah. Maybe even uh, two because now really? I like care less about money. Yeah. <laughs> but like <laughs> yeah. um, the reality like uh, people would be like why aren't you charging more? And P and G would be like this. And I was like I don't want to be Gillette. Where every time someone, I love Gillette. I like, you know, I used to shave, uh, I used to be clean shaven. I'd be like, I want a Gillette razor blade. It feels so good across my face. Yeah. Feels like, you know, sublime. Yeah. Um, but every time I use a Gillette razor blade, I'm like, oh my God. Like I buy, I go buy a four pack yeah. at Dwayne Reed. They're so expensive. Somebody like, you know, first I've got to call a police officer to come with me and escort me. <laughs> and he's got his gun drawn. Like if you take yeah. this, I'll shoot you. Yeah. Cause it's the most valuable thing in there. And then I go there and I'm like, I need a firm for this Gillette razor blade. Yeah. Uh, and they're like, you're raise some money. You're like, they're like, yeah, your Amex black has been maxed out on this uh, <laughs> Gillette razor blade. I was like, I don't want that. Yeah. Yes, we can charge more and make more money. There is a gut check element to all of these things. And, um, you know, Peter Thiel always asks this question. What do you believe that other people don't believe? Or like, what's your most controversial opinion? Mine is that data is overrated. There is a gut check where I'm like, we're charging too. We can charge $5. It's not the right price point. It's going to make people hate us. And you got to think about this for 30 years, 50 years. Yeah. And I want people, I want people when they think about our brand to want to get up and applaud from their socks. And this is going to get people to boo us. Yeah. Um, and that's what, that's why we ended up charging $3. Interesting. Okay. What about your, uh, like, uh, what, what, what do you see with the brands that you're working with when it comes to upsells and cross sells? Uh, usually the upsell revenue will drive an additional 15 to 20% revenue. So if their AOV was, you know, if the AOV is normally 50, they can get to 60, early 60s with, um, as AOV with upsells. But um, 
but I didn't I didn't look into the post purchase upsell. Okay. Well, yeah. I love that you answered the I went on for 10 minutes and didn't answer the question. I think you're like 15 <laughs> <laughs> percent. Uh, okay. Let's, I think we have time for one more question. Um, okay. okay. Actually, could we do, um, could we do this one? Which row? Uh, row nine. That's exactly what I was looking okay, at. Okay, cool. Too. Okay. Kujid asked this question. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's a uh, cool Jeet. Cool Jeet. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Cool Jeet. Uh, you are bootstrapping a new brand. You have limited time and resources. What are the three tools, things you want to invest time and money into? I love this question. I get this. This is probably the number one question I always get. Okay. And uh, and you I answer. think if you're zero to one, um, there are so many distractions in starting a brand, which is, I think, what make it so exciting and fun to do and fun for people to talk about. And you think you're going to be, you know, getting sponsored and taking photo shoots and doing all this shit. But really, all it comes down to is, I think, increments of uh, incremental goals. So the first goal is, how do I get $1,000 a day in sales? The second goal is, how do I get $5,000 a day in sales? Then $10,000, then $25,000. And then you don't have to worry. Like Once you hit $10,000, you pretty much don't have to worry about the next increment. It's almost guaranteed to come. But most people fail to get to the $5,000 a day uh, because they focus on all the wrong things. And I think the three things you got to focus on is the offer. So how do you position the offer? And it doesn't just mean the dollars off, but it means how are you talking about how somebody's going to use the product? When are they going to use it? Why are they going to use it? What's it going to do for them? Uh, the second one is the ads. So like, how are you making it enticing to even earn somebody's attention and click to get to your offer? And then the uh, third one is the landing page. Are you providing enough information there? Are you making, it's not even just a landing page, but it's kind of like the, the funnel. Is it easy to check out? Do you have an easy cart? Does your cart glitch? Like there's a, a store we work with uh, on the side and uh, you know their cart keeps breaking every time they push a new update to their site. And it's like, we can't get to two grand a day if the cart keeps breaking because you know, it just Nobody doesn't can work. Nobody check out, you yeah. motherfucker. Yeah, this exactly. This is the only thing you got to fix. There's like 60 people adding to cart and zero people checking out. But but everybody gets um, caught up in, oh, what app should I use for this? And what thing should I use for that? And really it comes down to just these three things, positioning, the ads, and the funnel. And then uh, the one app or two apps, I would say you should, three apps I would say you should definitely have. One is no commerce, so you can actually read customer, um, you can collect customer surveys post-purchase. And if you're a new brand trying to get to 2K a day, that really helps you unlock why somebody came to purchase. And also you should ask, uh, how long did somebody know about this company before they decided to purchase? The second one is reviews, because you the more social yeah. proof you have, the easier it becomes to acquire customers. Yeah. And I think that's some place that, that's a spot that a lot of people don't really focus on. And then the third and, and focus on in a way, meaning like, are you creative? Are you understanding when the order is being delivered and then making sure you're sending an email that catches attention to ask them to come review? And then the third one is um, Microsoft Clarity, which is you just throw a pixel on your site. It's completely free. Uh, and you can look at heat maps, scroll depth maps and user recordings. And I've I've spent hours just watching user recordings and then it re you rearrange a page and boom, a page just converts much better. Uh, that is a fantastic answer first. Uh, I love what you said or originally. The ad, the offer, and the landing page uh, yeah. are the three things to focus on. I think that's so true. Um, don't focus on partnerships. Don't no. focus on PR. No. Don't focus on things that aren't scalable. Like you got to focus on things that work um, and, and like are scalable. And so I think you're absolutely right about those three things. Don't focus on, you know, fo you want to make your brand look good, but you don't need to focus. You don't need a full blown, you know, uh, brand strategy for mm -hmm. your brand. If you just launched a business and you're bootstrapping, like that's, you don't even need very good branding. Like you can yeah. be, it can be mediocre. Um, okay. So I love what you said later on as well. Reviews. We're both investors in Okendo, so you should use Okendo, but like re reviews are uh, great yeah. and super important. I, I think this is something you should focus on early on because when you, someone lands on your site, the first thing they're going to want to see is social proof. Right. And that social proof is reviews. That's how we buy on Amazon. For me, if for, in 2015, if you were starting your business, I'd say the only thing you need to focus on is reviews on your site. Now I'd say you probably want somebody to do one or two YouTube videos as well, because people are going to search there for social proof as well to make sure that your product is legit, you're not a scam, that it works, all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, MS Clarity is such a good one. I, I've never used it, and that is such a good one. And yeah. it's free. Completely what free. Yeah. This is the one I'm going to disagree with you on, which is no commerce. I love, I, I know the no commerce guys and I respect those guys. If you're bootstrapped and early on, you should be emailing all of these guys personally. Yeah. Uh, so in the same way, that, like the way to ask for a review is to email that person and be like, Nick, you just bought a deodorant from us. Thank you so much. We're a small family business. We really appreciate it. If you loved your experience with Native, please, here's a link. Please leave a review. If you didn't, please respond to this email and tell me why you didn't love it. I'd love to make your experience better and I want to make this uh, brand better and I want you to love it. Let me know. Thanks, Moyes. That's how we got reviews. People would always be like, how do you have all these reviews? Are they fake? And I'm like, what are you talking about? We just send out this email. Are you guys, are you not sending out an email? <laughs> yeah. Like, are, this isn't rocket science. Yeah. Like, send the out worst thing is, is you just set up the, uh, the generic email review capture. So bad. And you're like, it's not working. Yes. Yeah. You, yeah. you need to personalize that. Yeah. Um, but I also think that, like, you know, from an early brand standpoint, I, I would have no problem. You should call the first hundred customers you get. Send them a message and be like, hey, I'm Nick Sharma. I just started this brand. Uh, I think you're really going to love this product. If you have any problems, let me know. I'd love to talk to you for five minutes if you've got it about why you purchased native deodorant. Do you got five minutes? Like, yeah. here's my phone number. Call me anytime. And I think that's really powerful because then you're going to say, how long were you thinking about buying something from us? What got you excited about it? Yep. Like, you know, all those things, you'll get a lot more information from those five minutes. So I, I do think that there's a place for new commerce. I think it's a little bit later down the line. But if you're bootstrapping a new brand, it's not surveys. You need to do the work of like getting into the people's uh, on people's phones, yeah. text them. Hey, Nick, you just purchased from us. That's so awesome. Thank you. We're a small brand. I really appreciate it. How, why'd you choose us? Like get into conversations yeah. so you can learn about the customer. I love that idea. Uh, but otherwise I couldn't, I love what you said. Add offer landing page. The honest answer is do not focus on PR. Do not focus. Do not on, do PR. Yes. Do not do, uh, <laughs> you know, any of those types of things. There are so many distractions trying to avoid those. And the three that you mentioned are right on point. It's crazy to think about, like, I feel like two years ago, um, any brand that was starting, like one of the early questions I'd always get, Hey, what do you think of this PR agency or what's a good PR agency? And it's like, dude, you're about to pay these guys $25,000 to just to do the same thing you could do, get an email and email somebody and suggest a pitch. And that, that email will get you five sales. Like you'll, you're going to be yeah. on Buzzfeed and it's going to yeah. be uh, uh, maybe 50 sales. Right. And you spend $25,000 this month and you spend 25,000 next month too. Are you crazy? Yeah. Are you rich? And it's, it's also funny because in the, in the long run, looking back on all those companies that thought they were just building brand, those companies didn't build any brand. That's right. Yeah. Brand comes from sales. People yeah. using your product, loving it and talking to other people about it, not yeah. from being, you know, and featured in the New York Times once. Right. That's not how you build a brand. Totally. Uh, okay. I think that's uh, all the time we've got. We're going to do another one of these. So again, if you want to ask Slack. questions, yeah, please join the Slack group. It's uh, limitedsupplypod.com. It's fantastic. It's really starting to blow up. We've got thousands of people that are active there. No salesmanship, no pitches. It's really good. Uh, please join in. Uh, and this was a ton of fun, actually. These were great questions. These were awesome. I love these. Honestly, our Slack fucking rocks yeah it is the they best. know us yeah it's the best yeah okay looking forward to episode five talk to you guys soon see ya thanks for tuning in we'll be back next time to cut through the noise in cpg retail and e-commerce and if you enjoyed this episode then why not share it with a friend and be sure to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to your podcasts on